Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome back and good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, the session with the keynote lecture and I'm honored, privileged and delighted, personally delighted to introduce our keynote lecturer who I hope is already um, uh, available and will, okay, I, I get a thumbs up from upstairs. Um, so, um, our keynote speaker today is the most recent appointment at uh, directorial level in uh, the Max Planck Law Network, uh, Marietta Auer. Uh, Marietta read law, uh, but that wasn't enough, uh, law, philosophy, and sociology at the University of Munich. Uh, she then did, um, as I was just told, actually yesterday, her state exams in the land where it's the most brutal, namely in Bavaria. Uh, where, so she graduated with the first and second state exams. There she then uh, did her doctorate in law in Munich and also her habilitation. Um, this is not her, by the way. <laughs> she, she comes in different guises, I know, but no, that's not her. Um, she, she actually is in different guises. She's not just a, a qualified German lawyer, but also a qualified American lawyer. She um, holds an LLM and an SJD from Harvard and um, successfully passed the New York bar exam. Um, having acquired all these um, qualifications, she then became a professor, a chairholder, uh, for private law and legal philosophy at the University of Gießen. And since 2020, she's been uh, director at the institute formerly known as the Max Planck Institute uh, for European Legal History, but since her arrival, it's the Max Planck Institute for Legal History and Legal Theory. And obviously, the clue is in the name. Um, she is a legal theorist and legal philosopher, first and foremost, but also uh, the very distinguished private lawyers. Private lawyers. So her main research interests are perhaps at the intersection of private law and private law theory. And um, she is interested in what she calls um, the multidisciplinary foundations of law, especially the philosophical and theoretical ideas underpinning private law. And that leads her into very different areas, um, doctrinal private law, as most German private law professors, but also uh, she recently spoke about um, AI. Uh, she was an expert in a hearing in the Bundestag on the restitution of the holdings of the Hohenzollern. So you can see there is actually quite a spectrum that she covers. Uh, she has received a variety of distinctions and awards. I'm not going to embarrass her by um, um, listing all of them. Um, perhaps uh, uh, a very impressive one is the prize of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities 2017. And perhaps a unique uh, feature is that she has been um, an awardee of the annual um, Law Book of the Year um, award twice. Um, most people don't even get there once, but she actually got it both for her PhD thesis and for her habilitation. Um, and she's actually a really nice director to work with, as we found out in Frankfurt. Uh, so I am indeed not just um, honored, uh, I'm really delighted that she's agreed to give today's keynote lecture, which is on Tomorrow's Epistemology of Legal Science, the Case of Private Law. So, Marietta, now the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Stefan. This is really too kind. Um, and thank you for not mentioning uh, prizes or anything like that. That would really be too embarrassing. So let me start now. I'm really happy to be here today, even though only virtually. But I hope I will get across what 
what I have to say about legal epistemology, and I hope we have a lively discussion on that. So let me try to, to share my screen. Yeah, my today's lecture will be on tomorrow's epistemology of legal science. What an ambitious title, the case of private law. Now, how do we know what tomorrow's epistemology of legal science will be? Well, the most obvious answer is, well, we don't. We just don't know. But perhaps we can make something like an educated guess if we look at the present and past epistemologies and then extrapolate to the future, or what the future might be. And this is precisely what I will try to do in the coming three quarters of an hour. I will have a look at past epistemologies in legal scholarship and present epistemologies and then try to draw a line as to where we stand right now and where we are heading in the future. And I will be focusing on private law, but this much of what I have to say also applies on the other fields of legal scholarship. So my talk will consist of five parts. First, I will give a general overview um, of epistemic models in legal scholarship since the 19th century as a whole. And this first part will serve as a general or systematic introduction to the idea that there is no single way of doing legal scholarship. The epistemologies used in legal scholarship are diverse and I have the idea or I had the idea that it would be useful to sort them into three distinct types or sometimes overlapping types, but three types, I think. And on this basis, I will then try a historical sketch of again three, but one three doesn't have to do with the other three, three phases, three historical phases of private law scholarship since around 1800. And these three phases will be the focus of the parts two to four of my talk. So part two will deal with the paradigm of the German historical school prevalent in the first half of the 19th century. This is followed in part three by the analytic scientism of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And the fourth part will then address the turn to social private law since the Weimar Republic followed by the value jurisprudence um, of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. In the fifth and final part, I will then address tomorrow's epistemologies of legal science and will try to sketch out some future possibilities for the development of private law scholarship. So let me start with my first part, a typology of three main avenues of legal epistemology that have as I think time and again recurred since the 19th century. And I will call those three paths, idealism, scientism, and analyticism. And what I want to show is that there is no single path of epistemology which exhausts the depth of legal scholarship. Any scholarly approach that acts as if there is only one true path and considers all others invalid, quickly finds itself in a dead end epistemically speaking. And this is something that has happened several times since 1800. And each time this happens, the other avenues once again come into view. In other words, there is what one could almost describe as a cyclical reoccurrence since the 19th century of all three avenues, none of them able to definitely prevail over the others. So let us start with the first typical avenue idealistic legal thought. It is well known that all theories of natural law since antiquity have been idealistic. You might be keen to ask, why should this be of interest to contemporary legal scholarship? Indeed, okay. since the anti-metaphysical turn of the 19th century, the natural law path is no longer defensible as a guiding model for legal research. There are, of course, natural lawyers, neo-natural lawyers, but as a sort of mainstream, mainstream course, this isn't feasible anymore. However, this in no way implies that the idealist pattern of legal reasoning might have become meaningless in the, in the meantime. Not only Kantian legal philosophy, but also value elements associated with different practical philosophies like Hegel, Aristotle, or the scholastics or late scholastics, exert and have exerted a profound influence throughout the 19th and 20th centuries that continues into the present. 
and that is despite the professed anti-metaphysics of modern legal positivism. This insight is, for instance, prominently on display in Carl Schmitt's political theology thesis that the key concepts of modern state theory are ultimately secularized theological concepts. So actually questions of belief, basically. So as we can already see here, it's all a bit more complicated than one might think. Once a path of legal knowledge has been tread, it's no easy feat to go back and just declare it invalid. So let's turn to the second type of legal epistemology. We can be called scientism, realism, or empiricism. In Germany, a pioneer of this approach was Julius von Kirchmann, who in the middle of the 19th century complained about the worthlessness of jurisprudence as a science and did this very famously. And that was a claim essentially based on an analogy to the contemporary natural sciences. In the period that followed the historical school, various attempts thus have been made to bridge the epistemological divide between the natural sciences and the humanities in such a way that legal science finds itself, so to speak, on the correct modern natural scientific side of the divide, namely as something close to an empirical social science on par with contemporary exact methodology. Which methodology this specifically means, however, has shifted several times since the end of the 19th century. Modeled on subsequent paradigms on sociology and psychology, one initial attempt was Rudolf von Jering's purposive jurisprudence, as well as the sociological and realist schools of law from the 1900s to the 1970s. More recently, economics has superseded sociology as the guiding disciplines in the social sciences, so that the emergence of law and economics as a new realist paradigm with a temporal delay was also a foreseeable development in legal scholarship. If law and economics didn't already exist, one would literally need to invent it on the basis of the general epistemic mode of the current culture. A further consequence is that the more mathematical and empirical law and economics or modern economics actually becomes, the more mathematical and economic or empirical law and economics also needs to become, as is in fact increasingly the case in the USA and more recently also here in Europe. Yet, as the history of empirical methods in legal scholarship has shown, the promised exactitude is finally unobtainable. Legal scholarship, much like empirical sociology, psychology, or neuroscience, unfailingly evades empirical modeling whenever its own normative logic is at stake. The realist paradigm thus predictably proves to be something like a self-referential hall of mirrors of empiricist artifacts that move at an invariable equidistance to the intrinsic rationality of law. This path is therefore also unable to conclusively solve the question of legal epistemology. But finally, there is a third research paradigm which continually re-emerges as a reaction to the failure of the previous two paths. If we leave aside all its partially contradictory individual styles, this third paradigm can be described as analytic. It comprises first all positivist theories of law, which have in regular cycles called for the purification of legal science of idealistic or, relativist or, or realistic premises. A particular good and obvious example here is Kelsen's pure theory of law. The positivism of HLA Hart and his successors also belongs to this camp. And although in the different sense, contemporary concepts of doctrinal law, including its methodology, should also be mentioned here. To this day, the avowed goal of doctrinal methodology lies in the most authentic possible application of a canon of authoritative legal sources. At the same time, a concept of legal scholarship confined to such an autonomous canon of sources and methods constitutes the characteristic paradigm of legal modernity. 
And Niklas Luhmann's concept of law as an autopoietic system, so system theory, is maybe the most apt expression of this paradigm. Modern law understood in this sense presupposes a typical institutional backdrop, which you can also trace in these theories. And this backdrop includes a tiered structure of the legal order, typically a distinction between primary and secondary rules, as well as the adjudic adjudicability and alterability of legal acts in legal procedures. So a thoroughly closed legal worldview. Yet the analytic paradigm too, ultimately ends in a dead end, which has of course been the source of numerous critiques of legal formalism and conceptual jurisprudence since the 19th century. How then does one arrive at legal scientific knowledge? The solution, it's probably all about striking the right balance between the different epistemic pathways, depending on the concrete problem at hand. What I will try to show in the following is this, However the balance is struck, it bears the unmistakable features of the dominant scientific paradigm of the respective time. In other words, the more metaphysics or metaphysical the time, the more idealism or idealism one finds in legal epistemology too, the more natural scientific a given time, the more realism and empiricism. And when we are lost in the post metaphysical vacuum of modernity, then suddenly we become analytic. But this again runs up against limitations because we're finally unable to detach ourselves from both the cultural idealist sources of the law and from the empirical reality of the world. So as a result, we can see a genealogy of historical paradigms of legal thought. And I'm going to propose in the coming parts that this genealogy mirrors successive models of knowledge in the development or in the general development of the contemporary science and humanities. And that is actually where most or a big part of the dynamics of legal ep epistemologies comes from. So let me turn to my second part, which is the first historical part. And in this second part, I will describe the formation of the science of modern private law during the first half of the 19th century. The leading movement in this development was, of course, the German historical school beginning with Savigny. Now, what was the paradigm created by this school? One key element, which is still normatively dominant or at least valid in private law scholarship today is idealistic. That is, it is based on the idea that all private law has a source in the a justifying root and a source in um, a, the unifying principle of private autonomy. This idealistic root is clearly derived from natural law and enlightenment philosophy. And while the historical school always denied it and acted as though it was only concerned with historical source exegesis, there is in fact a strong idealistic core contained in the idea that there is something like a coherent system of private law even today. What's more, according to this idea, private law relationships are not only separate from, but also prior to the state and to public law. Again, the root of this thinking which is of course a very basic sketch and just sort of a, a normative idea. I'm not pr proposing that this is sort of the reality of private law, not at all, yeah? I'm going to talk about that much more, yeah? So, but the root of this idea is in enlightenment philosophy. And this is particularly evident in the work of Immanuel Kant, whose concept of private law is identical with the entirety of transcendentally founded individual private rights. And that is a very, very strong basis indeed for private right. A right according to Kant can appear in one of three forms as a right against a person, a right to a thing, or a right to a person akin to a right to a thing. And the main point of the Kantian philosophy of right is this, private rights are innate rights. They precede the state and are carried over into the state by means of public law, while their content is basically left unchanged by this transition. Perhaps the most innovative scholarly achievement of the historical school consisted in having blended this idealistic view of private right with classic Roman law 
into a functioning system of modern private law. A functioning system in this sense is systematic enough to allow for general reasoning, but not too abstract to solve concrete cases. One can speak of an optimal level of abstraction where successful concepts and methods of jurisprudence are typically situated. And it is precisely on this optimal level that Savigny's system of contemporary Roman law operates and creates a new mixed form out of the Roman dualism of persons and things on the one hand and the threefold division of Kantian right on the other. The resulting system, that is the threefold division between property law, the law of obligations, and family law, shapes the system of private law to this day. And decisive for this integrative achievement was the so called Pandict system. This five pronged system consists in its three middle parts of the three system categories I just mentioned, which were developed by Kant and Savigny that is, property law law of obligations and family law. Moreover, it recognizes the law of succession as a fifth independent part of the system. And it summarizes the general doctrines on rights, persons, and so forth in a preceding first general part. Over the course of the 19th century, the Pandic system, which was initially only conceived as a teaching aid, developed into something like the leading idea of what a principled system of scientific private law should look like. And ironically, the system finally derived its normative power from a legislative act. So not from legal science, not from its inherent principle structure or something, no, from a legislative act, which was the enactment of the German Civil Code in 1900. Yet the decisive factor of its success as the basis of modern private law scholarship in Germany up to today, still seems to lie in something like its productive mixture of Roman law sources, an idealistic concept of private right, and just the right amount of juridical concession to the practical needs of private law. Even today, this seems to represent a productive mixture capable of spurring fruitful private law scholarship. So by the mid 19th century, however, it became increasingly clear that the Pandic system together with the historical method of the historical schools weren't simply enough to cope with new challenges of private law, such as posed by the increasing mass of private law legislation, which was already a big point back at that time, not just today, but already then. So a new method was needed, which brings me to this third part of my talk and the second period I wish to talk about, namely the juridical scientism of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Since the mid 19th century, there was something like the feeling that the historical method was no longer adequate to the task. Instead, there was a growing demand for new, genuinely juridical and thus autonomous science of the law. The expression of this new vision of a truly juridical method was a new style of legal doctrine as a skilled endeavor which could only be mastered by the best legal minds of the time. This development can be described as a new analytic, but also, as we will see, scientist paradigm. One promise of this new view was clear in any case. The rational treatment of the applicable law was no longer bound to the premises of the historical schools, which were at this point considered outdated. Behind this shift, and this is now the, the sort of the, the juncture or the, um, the point where we meet the general theory um, of or history of science, and this is what sort of what is interesting here, is that we have um, a simultaneous honing of the norm of scientific objectivity in the contemporary natural sciences, such as biology, chemistry, and physics, and medicine, actually. For a long time, these natural sciences had proceeded in the style of natural history, so not altogether different from the interpretive style of the historical sciences. But in the late 19th century, the formulation of scientific laws, which left room for subjective interpretation by the scientist, so like scholars in medicine or chemistry who interpreted their laws or um, made drawings and um, 
elaborated their drawings of the human body on something like this. This wasn't um, considered a science anymore. Um, so the idea that scientific laws could be formulated, which left room for subjective interpretation was suddenly frowned upon in the natural sciences. So scientific exactitude and true science became incompatible with the interpretation of facts by the scientist. So either science or interpretation, but not both at the same time. The facts sort of had to speak for themselves or be reproducible through mechanistic devices or methods. So the lesser degree of the, the degree of interpretation, the more mechanistic, the better. Thus, legal scholarship relying on interpretive methods even more than the other social sciences or humanities faced a major problem if it was to remain a science on par with contemporary natural sciences. So the response of private law scholarship to this challenge was complex. On the one hand, it developed a set analytic, positivistic, generally doctrinal approach to legal scholarship. On the other hand, however, it embarked on the search for an objective reality of the law purged of as many interpretive artifacts as possible. And it looked for this objective reality analogous to the contemporary natural sciences. And this second characteristic is probably best described as legal scientism. The paradigmatic formulation of this scientific research paradigm came from Rudolf von Jering. In a programmatic essay published in 1950, uh, 18, sorry, 1857 at the launch of his new journal, the Jerings Jahrbücher, he formulated a new methodological idea for private law scholarship that combined scientific objectivity with doctrinal and practical productivity. The key concept known to many of you was the so-called higher jurisprudence, höhere jurisprudence, which resonated strongly with and this is important, chemical metaphors, also from other natural sciences, but Deering was a specific friend of chemistry. In particular, the higher jurisprudence was supposed to emerge from the lower jurisprudence as one aggregate state of a chemical element emerges from another. According to Deering, all law consists of legal substance, which changes its character via the alchemistic processes of legal science. Through legal science, the legal raw substances are transformed into a coherent intellectual body, which for Yering presents itself to experimental exploitation or exploration. In my view, it is essential that Yering's natural scientific character characterization of legal doctrine not be understood as a mere metaphor, but that rather against the backdrop of the new fashion of scientific objectivity as a valid representation of the contemporary paradigm of exact science. So there was a real sort of hype of the natural science. And this was also the explicit goal of private law scholarship. So Yering even went as far as to propose that a science of private law living up to the ideal of scientific objectivity would be the highest philosophy of law at the same time. Now, ultimately, this maximally holistic paradigm of legal scientism never succeeded. After all, legal scholarship is not an exact natural science. Legal scholarship was simply incapable of keeping pace with the rapid rise and mathematical formalization um, of physics and chemistry at the turn to the 20th century. But nevertheless, the desideratum formulated by Yering of a legal scholarship that was both analytically honed in its doctrine and empirically precise in terms of its scientific methods was by no means given up. This lofty goal lived on um, because um, the paradigm of physics and chemistry of which the early Yering had dreamt was soon replaced by the methods of the most current social sciences, which tried at the same exactitude around 1900. So the later Yering, who emphatically proclaimed law to be a means to an end, was again leading the charge of this development. 
his now commitment to purpose as the creator of all law in no way meant that he had abandoned his earlier claim that legal science must make use of the most advanced methodologies sourced from all branches of science. In his later writings, he simply replaced the natural historical methods with purpose as the touchstone of legal epistemology. And even more tellingly, just a few years before Sigmund Freud's interpretation of dreams, Yering defined the purposiveness in law as a psychological law of causality. And thereby once again tried to connect with the exact sciences, namely with neurology. So this combination of legal doctrine and methodological scientism is once again characteristic of private law scholarship in the second half of the 19th century. The dawn of a new century placed the source basis of German private law on new footing. On January 1st of 1900, the German code, German civil code came into force. So what changed as a result? Ultimately, I would say not that much, at least much less than one might think. First, as I said before, the code follows the structure of the pandic system. So all older, especially idealistic connections are therefore still plausible. It is therefore a fallacy to regard the codification of private law as a direct abrogation of 19th century private law scholarship. Even though one might be tempted to create an intellectual opposition between democratic legis legislation after 1900 on the one hand, and what Savigny and Puchter had called the scientific law of legal academia on the other. More precisely, the primary fault lines between the state of private law scholarship between, before 1900 and that of today lies neither in the canon of legal sources nor in the abrogation of private law scholarship. There wasn't less, but rather more freedom of doctrinal construction after 1900. It just changed its form. Doctrinal construction became legal interpretation. The method of private law scholarship shifted without curtailing the freedom associated with it. The decisive question in private law scholarship was therefore, and is actually still today, how should this room for free interpretation be used? And here we initially see after 1900, a continuation of the scientific or the scientific paradigm that had been established before the turn of the century. And we can actually, um, extrapolate this until today. So, but back to 1900, free law and scientific construction became a problem around 1900, not because private law was now codified, but rather because creative interpretation had become objectionable as a scientific method seen against the background of scientific objectivity, which I described. Only because of this background could also is, sort of one could say that legal positivism emerged as a credible jurisprudential theory around the same time that is around 1900. So now let's move on in the first half of the 20th century with Philip Heck's jurisprudence of interest. This was developed in the first two decades of the, of the 20th century. And this is actually paradigmatic of the scientism um, blended with the codified system. So what did Heck do? So sharply rejecting the free law euphoria of the turn of the century, his theory again strove to achieve the most comprehensive level of objectivity in the interpretation of law. So there is no difference in this sense between Heck and Yering. So for Heck, just as for Yering, the scientific basis of legal knowledge had to be empirically founded and objectively sound. The source of Heck's empiricism, however, differed fundamentally from Yering's due to the shift of legal sources from academic construction to legislation. Thus, Heck rejects Yering's jurisprudence of reconstruction and instead proposes a strictly subjective theory of interpretation, a kind of originalism strictly bound to the legislator's will. At its root, however, Heck's attack on Yering doesn't turn on legal sources, but again on legal epistemologies. For Heck, the fault of conceptual jurisprudence in, in the style of the early Yering does not lie in conceptual realism, but much more fundamentally in scientific arbitrariness, which for Heck 
stems from interpreting any sources other than legislative materials. So this is how Heck expresses his claim of scientific objectivity in the law in terms of the subjective theory of interpretation, in terms of strict binding to the legislator and his expressed will in the documents of the legislation. Heck's writing, however, already revealed the methodological paradox that was to reappear in the development of private law throughout the 20th century and is still reeling us today. The paradox is this. On the one hand, there is a claim of scientific objectivity in the interpretation of law which under a codified legal system seems to repress scientific construction and limit it to strict interpretation of the law. On the other hand, however, this strategy simply didn't work. It didn't work from the outset. So limiting interpretation to statutory construction by no means narrowed the scope of legitimate interpretation, but instead extended it far into the realm of free decision. And this was noticed immediately by the free law adherents. During the Weimar Republic, this paradox of early 20th century methodology was the starting point for a new style of free doctrinal creativity, even among the mainstream private law scholars. So among just a few examples, among the lasting innovations of private law in the first half of the 20th century were doctrinal developments that on the one hand were closely bound to the wording of the civil code, while on the other, they opened it up for, for balancing of conflicting consideration on a large scale. One milestone was the development of the general clauses of good faith and good morals into something which could be called safety valves for substantive value corrections as well as judicial lawmaking in all areas of private law. As a result, the value structure of private law inherited from the 19th century began to slip since the 1920s. And while the institutional division of labor between legislation, adjudication, and legal scholarship had remained untouched for the time being, this too was soon to change under the rule of Nazi dictatorship. I will not go into details here, since the outlines of what happened to legal scholarship under the dictatorships are well known. It might suffice to simply point out the radicalized use of the general clause as a supra legal control norms, which opened up space for free judicial lawmaking, which was now no longer interpreted as an arrogation of power, but rather cherished in a perverse reversal of contemporary scientific values as a kind of personalized objectivity of the politicized judges. So how did all of this affect legal epistemology? Let me now turn to the fourth part of my talk and move on to post-war legal scholarship. After 1945, the most obvious um, ideological content was of course quickly erased from the private law system. What could not be erased, however, was the lasting shift in the institutional distribution of power between private law legislation, adjudication, and legal scholarship. The most notable new feature stemming from the Weimar era and the Nazi time was a greatly expanded scope for judicial lawmaking by balancing conflicting values. Accordingly, one of the most significant developments in private law methodology in the post-war period was the replacement of the jurisprudence of interest with the so-called jurisprudence of values. The jurisprudence of values was carried over into the post-war period by former leading private scholars of the Nazi era, such as Karl Lahrens. It's often uncritical use served to fill the ideological vacuum following the collapse of the Nazi regime with new substantive content, which now mostly stemmed from the new constitution, but also, especially in the early times of the Bonn Republic, of much from much older, namely natural law sources. On the basis of the civil code, which had survived the dictatorship, it was possible to once again create sophisticated doctrinal structures and to mold them into a new teleological system of private law. So in the resulting system, for instance, the principle of reliance now stood alongside contract law. And social corrections in landlord tenant law, labor law, or consumer protection were always moderate enough 
as so as to not fundamentally call into question the principled unity of private law, which was always upheld. The same held, held true of the new rules in growing fields like commercial, corporate competition and antitrust law. One could say that the particular style of private law scholarship of the Bonn Republic up to 1990 always attempted to strike a balance or find a middle ground, both politically and epistemologically. The political balance was achieved between the order liberal, free yet regulated understanding of the private law society on the one hand, and the bracketing of the public law within the welfare state on the other. The epistemic balance achieved was a mixed teleological analytical jurisprudence, partly grounded in empiricism, partly in idealism, and methodologically reinforced by a constitutionally renewed explanation of the binding power of law for the judiciary. So let me dwell on the post-war constitutionalization of private law a little longer. I don't hesitate to call this development the single most important doctrinal post-war innovation of private law. Its starting point was, of course, as we all know, the Federal Constitutional Court's famous 1958 Lüth ruling. Initially, it seemed as if the Lüth decision could be seamlessly embedded into the doctrinal structure of German post-war private law. The general clauses, which has served as access points for substantive values since the 1920s, were now functioning as a ready-made doctrinal tool for introducing constitutional values and balancing techniques into private law. Expressed through the doctrines of indirect horizontal effect and duties to protect, an initially stable balance was achieved between constitutional privacy, primacy on the one hand and the normative autonomy of private law, which was still upheld on the other. And this balance could be called a third defining paradigm of German private law science after the first historical philosophical model of the historical school and the second model of legal scientism of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So characteristic to repeat this once more of the legal, legal scientism um, or of the private law scholarship of the Bonn Republic was a combination of analytic and theological thinking. And all of this framed by regulatory interventions in the service of consumer protection and market control. And the normative aim was always directed towards something like a value compromise and finding a middle ground. And from today's perspective, this thorough seat or thorough search for a middle ground cannot be separated from history since Weimar and National Socialism. Finally, a pronounced increase in legislative interventions in private law only occurred in the last third of the century, of the 20th century. And initially, so that means in the cent or in, in the decades before that, um, these no or these legislative interventions or regulatory interventions could also be dealt with easily using the proven dogmatic constructions. Finally, there was also a strong and widely accepted power of to construct new doctrine of the highest courts, such as the Federal Supreme Court and the Federal Labor Court. And this power was widely accepted because it was usually exercised in constructive dialogue with private law scholarship. As things stand now, however, at the beginning of the third decade of the 21st century, the signs are once again pointing toward a brewing storm. So dynamic equilibrium systems can reach critical tipping points beyond which they start to move chaotically and eventually disintegrate. For the scientific paradigm of German private law, this has already happened twice, as we've seen, since the beginning of the 19th century. So if this chronology is correct, Legal science is on the cusp of another disintegration and reintegration under new auspices. Whether and how such a reintegration will take place, however, depends on whether and how the paradigm of private law scholarship, newly composed in the post-war decades, can be adapted in the long run as a suitable mode of describing private law relations. The possible tipping points are already present in the dynamics of the system right now. 
On the one hand, they lie in the ever-increasing mass of private law regulation of national and European Union origin, the disruptive effects of which are further intensified by the case law of the European Court of Justice. The other threat to the continued existence of a core of private law lies in the dynamics of its further constitutionalization through the federal constitutional court, which is also encroaching ever more deeply into its doctrinal system. Both developments are mutually dependent on one another and reinforce each other through the aspect of the primacy of the constitution and the primacy of private law legislation or regulation over the sphere of private autonomy. So what does all of this mean for the future of private law scholarship or tomorrow's epistemology? This brings me to the final part of my lecture. I will focus on two aspects which, I've been, which have been of recurring importance over the course of the last two centuries. And I hope that, was, uh, that sort of came out clearly. These two aspects are the structure of the, of the epistemology in connection with the general structure of scientific epistemologies. And the other is the idea of an autonomous private law system. If we look first at the question of epistemology, private law scholarship was only able to achieve a classic, one could say classic, enduring, that means not easily outmoded shape when it succeeded in striping um, a complex balance. And this is a balance between the autonomous or normative needs of the legal system on the one hand, and on the other hand, the empirical and idealistic foundations of private law in society. Epistemologically, all three phases of private law scholarship, which I described were similar in that they sought and found a connection to the most advanced methods of the contemporary natural and social sciences. For the historical school of the early 19th century, this connection lay in its common origin with the historical sciences. For the legal scientism of the late 19th and early 20th century, the connection shifted to the contemporary natural and social sciences. And one could say the least pronounced of the three phases was the private law model of the Bonn Republic, which it's with its mixed paradigm of the jurisprudence of values. And yet the relation of private law methodology to um, the empirical reality of private law and the scientific methods of the time was always only a necessary, but never a sufficient condition of a fully developed science of private law. In addition, this epistemology has always demanded a sophisticated analytical component that is justice to the intrinsic rationality of law and which also served legal practice. And finally, there is also an inevitable idealistic component involved, if one likes it or not, which rests on the enlightenment foundations of modern private law and beyond that has always reflected the entire nomos or normative universe, a term coined by Robert Cover of the contemporary society in German private law. This nomos in Germany never referred to the ideal of an ultra liberal night watchman state as we know it from the Anglo-Saxon culture. Rather, the idealistic value foundation of the historical school was replaced by the conscious value, value relativism, but still value conscious relativism prevalent around 1900, and eventually by the renewed substantive value thinking of the post-war period, which goes on until today. We are still figuring out which values are the right values for law and for private law. One lesson to be learned from the historical paradigm shifts in private law scholarship over the past two centuries thus is this. It's a futile endeavor to play empiricist scientist on the one hand and analytic doctrinal epistemologies on the other against one another. And the same applies to legal academia versus legal practice, both in its internal fruitfulness and external influence on the reality of law and society. 
the science of private law has reached its highest points of relevance only when it was capable of establishing a connection to the contemporary natural and social sciences, while at the same time offering useful guidelines to legal practitioners. So measured against these standards, a productive path for future private law scholarship should not seek to evade the current challenges of regulation and constitutionalizations by means of something like a flight from practice, for example, by deliberately, deliberately situating private law research beyond the scope of practice, by only doing historical or comparative research, or by doing purely economical uh, modeling. But the same also applies to the opposite danger of focusing research solely on the fine points of national and European private law regulation or adjudication. Rather, a fruitful future epistemology of private law will have to combine both extra legal insights and positive law on a new level of doctrinal construction. The current rise of legal pluralism which in some respects has more common with the fragmented private law sources of the 19th century than with the codified system of the 20th century, should in this respect not provide room for less, but on the contrary, for more challenging private law scholarship. Corresponding um, considerations also apply to um, the possibility and limits of the concept of a private law system. Just to be clear, there is no such thing as a comprehensive system of private law if understood as the result of a scholarly endeavor to collect and map all private law decisions, norms, and doctrines into one coherent scheme. To aim at such a system is indeed an unrealistic task for the future of private law scholarship. Systematic thinking, however, can do much more than this. In fact, private law scholarship will not be able to avoid updating both its inner system of values and the outer system of conceptual organization in such a way that both allow for an adequate representation of the meaning of private law in contemporary society. As a reminder, private law enables the autonomous formation of legal relationships as a residual power of social self-organization. This is what private law is all about, and this should be the guiding point of epistemology in private law. And this vital social task is by no means obsolete. On the contrary, the heavier the regulatory load of public law becomes in the future, the more urgent it seems at the same time to restate and reinforce the legal preconditions for autonomous self-organization through private law. Finally, this also means that there is more than enough room for the future institutional role of legal academia. As history has taught us, the key to the fruitfulness of the science of private law lies in striking just the right balance between the epistemological input of the contemporary exact sciences on the one hand and the autonomous demands of the legal system on the other. This also holds true, if not more so, for tomorrow's legal epistemology. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm very happy to take your questions. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Marietta, um, for this really brilliant exposition. Uh, the non-German lawyers in this room got the recent history of German private law in a in, in 40 minutes here, that, that's actually um, quite an achievement. Um, I'm, I'm supposed to uh, moderate the discussion and I'm aware that there's a few people uh, who join us virtually. Um, so I will take questions from the room. If there are questions from um, wherever you're based outside this room, uh, perhaps just um, type a Q in the chat into the chat function and I would ask our um, uh, support team of technicians perhaps to monitor the chat and then just um, uh, uh, wave wildly at me and I would then um, uh, ask you to to somehow um, put that person also on screen um, I think um, the, the number of, of people joining from outside is is should be manageable so, um, 
Obviously, I do like um, lectures about tomorrow's situation, five-part lectures that have four parts on the history. I think that's exactly the right approach. And, and this is why Marietta and the two more longer serving directors in Frankfurt get along so splendidly. Um, but of course, I mean, the, the many questions I guess might also be directed to the last slide and to the notion of a private law as the future domain of self-organization exclamation mark. So that obviously is a big thing. I mean, um, any questions to start with? or comments, protest. There is a yes, question Burkhard by Andy Peters. <laughs> oh. So Burkhard Hess, and then um, yeah, the chat. Thank you very much for this very inspiring uh, presentation and lecture. I have two points which I would like to ask you. Uh, my first point is about the role of the codification. I'm coming from procedural law and we have a clear disruption the moment in the late 19th century, the code of civil procedure entered into force and the whole procedural science changed. Um, my question is, the civil code in Germany had a big failure. It was a first world war and was this and you mentioned Philip Heck, for instance, was this uh, trauma when the code, which was made for stable times, did not operate any longer in the 1920s, a very important moment for um, the whole development of uh, the science of private law. And my second question goes in a totally different direction, more to the future. What about comparative law? What about Europe? What about, you have mentioned it, but I would like to know a little bit more, a court in Luxembourg, which maybe does not look to every German commentary and uh, needs to look to 27 national cultures. Yes, thank you very much for those very enlightening questions. I'll start with the first. Um, yes, of course, that makes a huge difference. I think uh, procedural law is a totally different world here. Yes, sure, it makes a huge difference when you look at procedure and the procedural law were um, uh, unified for the whole German Reich with, with the ZPO um, and the Reichsjustizgesetze. That, yes, so procedure started a new beginning with, with, with the first day of those new codifications. Sure. However, I would argue that it's different for substantive law. So um, the code isn't, one code isn't the same as another code. So it depends on what the code is about. And yes, the idea was to code all of substantive private law in the German um, civil code or the BGB. Um, and that actually worked out but um, so it, it did something new or it created a new uh, legal structure in that um, the um, prior sources of Roman law um, didn't apply anymore so yes that did change something but I would prefer to emphasize the continuation here first of all there was a deliberate effort not to disrupt the prior um, development of the law the code was the product of the 100 years of scholarship before, and it was it was this product consciously. So, and then again, the big thing is um, how do you interpret this? And yes, of course, you, you're totally right. So, uh, in the 1920s, with the Aufwertung, so with the hyper mass inf inflation, you got this real problem that uh, the economic order of the of the bourgeois society totally. Um, didn't work anymore and the time which was envisioned in 1900 was disrupted and something new started but again I would emphasize the stability of the of the German civil code and what you had in the 1920s was something which you already had in 1900 namely a totally unsecure insecurity how to how to deal with this new law so how to interpret it um, where's the openness uh, how are you bound to statutory law so that was a totally open thing and the free law school already 
tackled this around 1900, so before 1914 or 1918. So the second question, yes, you put that very nicely. So the, um, the ECJ obviously cannot look at every like um, peculiarity of the German private law or no, of course it cannot. It has to look to 27 natural national um, cultures, as you said, however, that's a problem. And well, I, do, I don't sort of, I don't have a conclusive answer here, but um, this does pose a problem for the structure of law we have in this country. So we will see where we are heading. This is obviously something where a lot of research can be done and has to be done. And yes, I would emphasize your point, comparative law is maybe something which might help in the procedure of how we define European law in future. However, one of the problems of private law systems is it's not so easy to um, create a supranational structure here. We have experienced this already. So there have been attempts, as you know, um, towards uh, European private law code or partial codifications. Again, we'll have to see where this is heading. This is obviously where the, where the problems are right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then in the chat function, um, Anne Peters and um, Christoph Engels showed up early on. I also have Alexandra Kemmerer and Adolfo Giuliani on my list. So if you want to be added to that list, just a wave. Um, uh, would it be possible to get Anne Peters on screen? Okay, great. Um, Anne, you may even start talking if you can hear us and, and then um, we will also see you in a second. I can hear you. Can you hear me? And we can even see you now. Ah, okay. Um, uh, thank you, Marietta, for this uh, brilliant talk. I would like to ask some questions and also give tentative own speculative answers, but I will be very short and I would like to hear whether you agree or I'm sure you have other uh, uh, ideas. So I think that law as such is a belief system. So it exists in our minds uh, and we put it on paper, but it only works because we believe in it. So you could say that it's definitely different from natural sciences because it is just an intellectual construct. But um, as, you, as you showed, there was always a fashionable science, sometimes a new science or type of scholarship which emerged, which then also was kind of the paradigm uh, also for legal argumentation, theology, mechanics. I think that Hobbes, for example, he, he, um, he analyzed the state also in terms of first the human body, but of course also he was very much uh, in the period that the mechanics uh, were interesting and he tried to dissect uh, the state like, uh, like with the work of a clock and then sociology and so on. So you didn't mention it, but I think it's pretty obvious that the current fashionable science, the current fashionable discipline is economics, which dominates everything and will also is the model for legal, legal thinking. So my question, what's the future lead science, which is just emerging uh, I think it's maybe like neuroscience and genetics and so on, and surely digitalization also plays a role. So what's, what's the current and the future fashionable model? And then second question, you said that it's inevitable to escape this idealist ingredient of our argumentation, our legal arguments. Um, so what's the current and future lead paradigm or idea. I think currently it's human dignity and human liberty, as you said, uh, with autonomy and so on. Um, but I think this might be changing that it becomes something more like uh, ecology or so um, as, a, as, one, as a key value. So I would like to hear from you or do you have some totally different idea? And then I think that besides the two trends you mentioned, regulation first, and then constitutionalization second. I think that internationalization, Bocates mentioned it, and you also mentioned it, but not, I think this should really deserves to be flagged out as a third very important trend. 
Um, and when you say that the indirect third party effect or um, Schutzpflichten, that this is the single most important invention, uh, I think that's, that's fascinating because it's exactly, it has been migrated also to the international level, the DRIT working. And it's now all about, this is a key question of international scholarship, whether human rights as the international counterpart to fundamental rights as codified in the constitution, whether uh, human rights also somehow have an influence and somehow regulate business actors. And we're just in the middle uh, of both international and domestic uh, regulation uh, on this key question in the area of, um, of uh, globalized capitalism. Yeah, thank you very much. And this is, um, yeah, <laughs> I can only agree. First question. I think I said that um, um, economics is sort of the scientific paradigm of the time. At least I tried to say that. I totally agree, couldn't agree more. Um, so actually very interesting, actually what you said about Hobbes and I totally agree with that too. So you see actually this is the formation of the mechanistic or the, the scientific worldview of modernity. Now I didn't sort of go into early modernity. This would have like taken another quarter of an hour or so. So I didn't do that. So what's the future? Do we see the future in neuroscience and genetics and digitalization? Well, I wouldn't count on too much um, fashionable, or fa fashionable um, sort of buzzwords that they really solve our problems here. Um, maybe it's conservative to say that we'll have to live with economics uh, for some longer time. As long as we have this kind of world order that we have in place, which is global capitalism and uh, which is what we are just doing. Yeah. So this is like the world order we are living in. We'll have to deal with economics. And notably, many future problems we are facing, like um, the problem you pointed out in your second question, ecology. So how are we tackling with, um, um, with, with problems of, um, um, of scarcity, yeah, so of um, limited resources and diminishing resources. That's all economic problems and we will need economy to solve or economics to, to solve that or not solve that. Maybe we cannot solve it, but we need economics to model that. So neuroscience, yeah, neuroscience is sort of a candidate um, which has been around since the time of Sigmund Freud as the future science. It has been the hope or the, the, the prime sort of candidate for the most hopeful future science of explaining it all by explaining human mind. This hasn't really worked out ever. So <laughs> yes, we are, we are getting there, but whether we'll go all way or whether we will, we will ever be able to achieve that, I'm, I have my doubts, I must say. Um, Genetics, same here. So there is always a bridge or a gap between, well, we have the genetic information and then we have the, the mind product or the person. Yeah, And that's interesting because we're, we're talking about something like um, a universality of code here. We are talking, and this brings me to digitalization. Yeah, We're talking about code, which will then explain knowledge through code or through like big data, which contains it all. Will this really hold? I have trouble, I have my trouble in believing that. However, it's definitely that the methodology of these fields and the sort of novel methodology developed here, most visible in digitalization, and thanks that you give me sort of the opportunity to talk about this here um, in, in the questions, will play a significant role and actually does so even today. Um, the third question internationalization yes maybe this was just too sort of evident for me that i i just forgot to point this out but of course you're right and this is actually what we are seeing so this is part of this of well in private law it's maybe it's maybe more pointed than in fields like well international law that's by definition international, but also in constitutional law or public law, this doesn't work on, on the national level anymore. And again, to point to this important field of ecology, so which you mentioned, we cannot solve the problems of, um, 
of climate change without a, a view to the whole world. So we have to use, we have to to take a, an international view on those problems. Otherwise, we will not be able to achieve anything, and this will of course shape our legal thinking. So thanks. Thank you. Can I can I just step in and and press you a little bit further on um, on a second point? Uh, uh, I think she used uh, or she referred to ecology in the context of the idealistic element. I mean, which you showed us. You showed us three paradigms, and you said none of them can ultimately be fully repressed. So at some stage, this idealist element must come in again. And you said that historically. Um, uh, the core idealist um, uh, uh, supposition was that of innate, uh, innate private rights and um, that could ultimately re be reduced to private autonomy. But, but that, it seems to me, is, is a, a reduction that would not hold if we're talking exactly about those problems of scarcity and resources that you have mentioned. So, so if there will be an idealist um, element in the future, I mean, could that be anything um, other than private autonomy? Um, and, and would that be? What would okay. that be? Thanks so much, because actually now I realize that I didn't properly answer the second question, which Indeed, I will... Indeed, your chair is taking care, yeah. <laughs> no, so what's the lead paradigm of values we have today? Yes, I would agree, something like um, global human rights, human dignity, human rights. Um, however, as soon as we get into scar scarcity problems, um, we face problems here, because rights cannot be unlimited. Or we have to accept rights of non-human actors, which of course you do. Um, ecology as such, well, difficult, yeah. So what precisely do we protect then? So as, and that's actually so, um, Stefan. This this brings me back to your question: um, Is it enough to reduce, or or can we really uh, sort of go forward with reducing the idealistic part of um, enlightenment thinking, or sort of the the yeah the idealistic idea of enlightenment thinking to normative individualism, so to individual rights, will this will this be enough? Well, probably no. I agree on that. However, I wouldn't be too. Um, I wouldn't sort of dismiss individual rights um, too early because it's actually necessary to use individual rights and especially individual property rights to avoid um, like common situations. It's, it's a very sort of um, difficult trade-off. Christoph Engel can of course say much more about this here, but um, it's not necessarily the case that individual rights lead to, a, to more exploitation of resources. It can also be the case that the more exploitation of resources comes from not protecting individual rights, but rather from protecting something, some commonality or something. So the question again lies in the mixture. And when we talk about individual rights, we have to talk about property rights. So how are future property rights shaped? Where can we accept individual property rights? Where which have the advantage of um, internalizing externalities where they can do this, but there are cases where they can't. And then we have to think about something else. But it's, again, it's not something we can play or trade off against one another. We have to find a mixture and combination. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, the next um, um, commentator uh, is Christoph Engel, who's also with us online. So. Could you perhaps uh, pull him up on the Hi. screen? And Christoph Engel, if you can hear me, uh, there he is. Yes, I, I can easily hear you, and it seems you can even see me. Uh, wonderful talk. But unfortunately, I have the habit of getting suspicious if I so much agree with the speaker. And in listening to you, I wondered whether you could also have titled this as a big justification story about legal scholarship as opposed to what the Americans do. So you could almost have said what the Americans do is a dead end. Look at the Germans, they do it right. And maybe they do it right, I don't know, but it went very quick into that normative judgment. And I wanted to give you a chance to 
uh, say whether I'm overstating uh, the point. A second point I'd like to at least put on our screens is epistemology sounds very far away from the conflicts of the day, but the lawyers always engage with conflicts and the epistemological developments you showed us were all quite visibly political in a certain way. Uh, so the liberal program, then uh, the socialists and so on, I don't have to work it out. Uh, but is that orthogonal, this political uh, divide so that essentially any political strand could pick any of those three and just orchestrate them? Or is there a natural uh, proximity between some of those schools and certain political perspectives? And if the latter, then I think we should be transparent about it. Okay. Thanks so much. So first, uh, no, I actually didn't intend to be normative in this sense. No, no, no. Um, yes, I was focusing on the German world here, but this is not at all like a feast of German private law scholarship. Of course, this can be done differently. Um, what to say? Yes, the American academia does it totally differently. However, the whole the whole legal culture is so different that you really cannot map this so it's it's it doesn't make real use to compare just the academia in one country to the academia in the other country because you will have to look at the whole legal landscape and how legal practice is done and so forth and it's like so no i'm, I'm totally non-exclusive here and i don't have a normative project here so i don't think the german way is the real way no it's actually totally under stress yes i do have the idea that it's not all wrong what we're doing yeah what's left of what we are doing, because we are doing many things which we haven't been doing like 20 years ago. So we're doing law and economics now, which we haven't been doing, or which was a big issue in Munich, as I remember it like 20 years ago or so. Yeah, just an example. But now we're doing it, we're doing it. So this brings us into deep questions of, of comparative law, or comparative scholarship, or comparative development of, of methodology. So are we um, converging or what's happening? So again, I wouldn't see a simple story here. I wouldn't say we just, we're just flatly conversing with, with the common law um, acad academic model because there is again, so much institutional difference. We, this will remain a separate world even though we are corresponding and maybe more than we did before. But again, there was a, an old time when people corresponded much more and so on. It's complex. I don't have a normative project. Your other question is very interesting. And this gives me, um, again, I have a clear answer here. I don't think there is a predisposition of any epistemological strand or a, or a sort of natural um, marriage of, of a particular epistemology to a specific politics. I don't think so. I can think, I think you can play all epistemologies both ways. You can do left-wing idealism like um, Herz Jesu Catholicism or something, you can do right-wing um, idealism, which probably comes to mind more easily today, but this is not inherently the case. Or you can do like idealistic human rights philosophy, which might be totally left-leaning or, but again, this is, even today, this is very micro. It's not left or right. It's like based on the question at hand, you can play it both ways. Same for uh, scientism. You can be, you can be like that's the old question of course yeah well is law and economics inherently right-wing politically no i don't think at all not not at all this again this can be used both ways this is a methodology which can cut both ways you can also use law and economics for social projects or communal property or something this is totally uncapitalistic um, substantially and just, or I don't have to um, sort of uh, go through this for, for analyticism, but again, the same story. So positivism or Kelsenianism can play, can sort of cut both, both ways. So again, I would say, and again, this is something for um, all junior researchers listening here. So whatever you do, you can really use it both ways. You should be conscious what you're doing. And indeed, I, I totally agree. You should be open about, about what you're doing. 
politically. And yes, there is always a, pol a politics behind it, but there is no necessary politics. It's the politics of the author. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from Alexandra Kemmerer, who is the head of the Berlin office of the Heidelberg Institute. A splendid talk. I learned a lot, lot uh, in a nutshell, in a sense. Um, I realized that apparently in private law theory, natural law is just a historical phenomenon. We saw it first at the beginning briefly, and then it reappeared in your narrative about the reconstitution of private law uh, in the Bundesrepublik after 1945. But from a transnational public law perspective, one gets increasingly now the impression that natural law is very much alive and kicking. And it comes in two guises, as secular, new secular natural law and as new sacred natural law, which is basically a kind of uh, neo-scholastic Catholic natural law um, in a sense. And it's a very strong trend that we see, especially in international human rights law. And we see also that there are interesting new constellations where this natural law um, reappearance in the form of also um, common good constitutionalism or other things realigns with strong technocratic traditions. If we look, for example, on new writings by Cass Sunstein and others. Um, so maybe that's only what the Americans do, but I would be interested whether in certain regulatory uh, constellations in private law, you could identify similar phenomena, which have, of course, a certain authoritarian um, streak in, in a way, um, and are, from a public law perspective, also in an interesting tension towards more majoritarian approaches. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, this is very enlightening because it actually highlights um, this thesis which I formulated very carefully so that natural law is actually something you cannot really defend because of a is odd um, sort of logical gap or mistake. However, yes, it's alive and kicking, good to know. Um, now, where would I see tendencies like this? Um, again, um, what is or the source of natural law thinking or the secularized um, sources of natural laws? Like you can see that sort of the great um, early modernity authors of secular natural law like Kant, like Locke, um, Rousseau, etc. So those people who really said, okay, we don't need God, but we need human rights, we need universal equality, etc., etc., etc. That is totally what we are still talking about. So when you look at private law here, where do we see something like secular natural law? Well, for instance, in the development of, well, I was just briefly touching upon the constitutionalization and um, the, the ever increasing importance of equality as a value of private law. So the old idea that private law is all about private autonomy and the freedom to discriminate against this person as opposed to that person in contracting with people so that you're totally free to choose whichever contract partner you would like to choose. That's over. That is just not accepted like this anymore. So there's a huge discourse going on about whether equality might be a supreme key value of um, private law, maybe even, um, even sort of supreme, the supreme value or superior to freedom. Yeah, sort of the old freedom paradigm doesn't fly anymore. So the second point, new, sec new, new sacred natural uh, law. Um, well, I found it interesting that you're pointing out the Catholic. There is another um, big thing one could talk about here, uh, which is religious laws all over the world. We could also talk about Islamic law, um, religious laws of, of all stripe. Yeah, we, we have religious laws all over the world. So the secular Western concept of law is actually a minority concept. So where do we find this in private law? Well, we find it at latest then when you have something like um, international, private international law and you have conflict of laws issue with, um, I don't know, a religious uh, legal system somewhere abroad, which happens every day. 
but this is just a very small example. And um, again, this is a big, big point to talk uh, to to think about in in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And our final question is uh, by Adolfo Giuliani, who is a researcher at uh, your own very own institute in Frankfurt. Professor, I, I was absolutely delighted to hear your uh, presentation, which is very close to my interests and I found uh, extremely important and uh, urgent. And uh, this is a, a small question from a legal historian, in other words, from someone who tends to see at uh, phenomena from the uh, long durée. Um, yeah, this turn between the 19th and the 20th century, which is so key, um, well, a legal historian um, would ask, okay, so what happened in those uh, decades? And probably um, his or her attention would be on uh, a shift, a tremendous shift of attention from the protagonist of a legal system, which is not anymore the legislator, but the judge. And that is the beginning of a reshuffle of the legal curriculum in which procedure becomes important. At the beginning of the, of the 20th century, procedure, the books on procedure uh, occupied half a of shelf, probably. After 20, 30 years, uh, there were much more. Um, so the question is, um, is perhaps the rise of jurisprudence and the rise of a legal science based on judge and judges as the protagonist, um, the vector or a, or a different uh, epistemology. Well, because we know that private law is the repository of uh, um, Russian, the, the, the private law has been made by rationalists, um, therefore with um, um, those priorities and uh, um, private law scholars have kept in the time Probably, if we go back to our time as a law students, we still remember the teachers of private law that were absolutely skeptical about uh, historical arguments and, and others. And whereas procedure um, works according to other, 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 uh, another epistemology. The um, simple question that was asked uh, around the, the mid 20th century was um, logical rhetoric. What is the true basis for judicial reasoning? The answer being is not logic because logic belongs to the legislator and judges uh, according to this new um, a stream of research that was observation-based, uh, uh, judge uh, according to other to other to, to other criteria, which is uh, rhetorical. Um, so, and perhaps I'm quite tempted to say that the importance of, pre of, of procedure in uh, in legal teaching, legal research was uh, the I mean the other side of legal science, which is uh, not uh, dogmatic based. Um, yeah, um, the other very small point. Um, yeah, um, a big turn, but that turn was also the rise of a focus on language. In other words, in, in, in the sense that language um, for the first time um, becomes uh, um, uh, object of, of doubts. Um, uh, language is not anymore um, uh, a clear um, uh, link between us and, 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 and the phenomena of the world, but is an unfaithful servant, as someone said. Therefore, we have to, to clarify the, the, the language. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Big thank you so much. question already, so maybe we'll <laughs> okay. keep it there. Thank you. Yeah, Director. thank you, um, Dr. Giuliani. Uh, well, first, um, I was, while you formulated your first question, I was figuring, I was again returning to this question which we had before, whether we are converging with um, the common law system or, the, or whether we are not. And I was thinking, yes, we are, but maybe the, the key difference is that we are offering much more importance to judicial lawmaking, or there is just simply much more judicial lawmaking and, and um, like precedent law around here in, in the continental system, but there is not at all the same importance of procedural law, at least not as I remember it from my own um, education. There is still the hypothesis that you can think about substantive law without the procedure, and this might be remaining um, a difference, even though Burkhardt Hess is in the room and might sort of um, object to that. We, this is, of course, a fallacy, or 
well, we, no, not of course, but we are still able or we are willing to figure out a system of substantive law devoid of the procedural questions, or we can think about that. And that is why we can think about judicial lawmaking or the doc, judicial doctrine without recognizing the procedural issues. Maybe this is a mistake. Maybe we should become more common lawish in this issue. Your second question, very briefly, um, the rise of the focus of language. Yes, there was a linguistic turn and you rightfully said language is an unfaithful servant. So also the linguistic turn in philosophy hasn't solved the world riddle and will not solve the riddle of epistemic knowledge. So this is, I don't think this is an avenue either, even though it's there are of course very interesting and important questions here. So thank you very much. I hope this was clarifying a little bit. Well, thank you, Marietta, um, for being available, uh, even if just online, but I think it worked very well. I mean, I, we could hear you clearly, see you clearly. Um, thank you so much. And I think a big round, a round of applause for our <laughs> keynote speaker. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you for the lively discussion. Thank you.